Um, the second speaker is Mayan Hamasma from the Ministry for Culture, Education and Science. She's responsible for, I think it's called Media right now, which covers the culture ministry's take on cultural heritage, on digitization, and she's going to respond to what we've heard and explain a little bit how the ministry is going to look at this. Get some help. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, dear Mr. Boyle, good afternoon or good evening. Mr. Boyle, thank you for your inspiring lecture. You gave us an excellent insight in the new territory that cultural heritage institutions have to explore now that we have fully entered the digital age. And you have showed us the consequences and challenges for heritage institutions, their users and their suppliers on a legal, technical and social level. Now, what makes your work valuable is your meaningful approach of the challenges of the digital age from a perspective of public value and public concern. You give us, guardians, scouts and officers working for public or publicly funded institutions, new views on familiar dilemmas. This is Paulus Potters de Veehoeder, herdsman in English, but literally translated as the guardian of cattle. I think it's an image that fits well on your concept of guardianship 2.0. Though the environment of this young curator doesn't seem too complex, he has to deal with both the resting and the more dynamic elements of his collection in a proper way. The images I will show, by the way, are from the wonderful collection of the Rijksmuseum, which is, as you probably all know by now, digital available for all of us in a high resolution. Ladies and gentlemen, the digital shift really affects our work in the cultural heritage sector. That aims, to put it shortly, at a rich cultural life for as many people as possible and good care for our cultural resources and remains. Before all, I am convinced that the incredibly fast development of digital technology offers great chances of enlarging the public value of all the cultural heritage in both the public and private collections. And the topics we are discussing today, and which were mentioned by James Boyle, are strongly connected to the agenda of our Minister of Education, Culture and Science, who has made the enlargement of the public value of culture a top priority in her policy. With this great opportunity of gaining public value and impact comes a shipload of new mind-twisting questions and problems. In a minute I will reflect on, this, on all the challenges, on all the changes and challenges that James Wall brought up, but first let me share some thoughts with you on how the digital shift affects the way that we can effectively work as civil servants for instance, at my ministry. The digital age is full of new and often complex, complex concepts, expressions and techniques. For policy and decision makers, it is therefore tempting to leave this hocus pocus mainly to the specialists. And I think we did, did just that in the past decades. And no doubt about it, the experts made unbelievable progress. But however, this habit has also created a gap between both, both between experts and public and between experts and managers. And I therefore think it's really important that we encourage a broader understanding of the properties, opportunities and risk of digital information and content. As James Boyle has argued in his famous book, The Public Domain, the debate on intellectual property should be pulled out of the technical and obscure. Essentially, it is about elemental and simple questions that are of true importance to all of us in, as Boyle calls it, the range wars of the information age. In my opinion, this is not only true for the debate on intellectual property, but for other related debates as well, on privacy, governance, technical infrastructure, authenticity, skills, and so on. 
Boyle's strong pledge to be readable and clear is certainly mine as well. And I reckon that we have similar rivers to cross here in science and in public management. One of the pressing questions for professionals in the public domain is how to get on speaking terms literally with the people that we actually work for. The conversation about the public domain must be brought back to the public domain. And the digital age offers great possibilities here, which we have only sparsely begun to discover. And I think the fine art of civil service is showing the ability and the nerves of committing yourself to the complex new questions in your field of policy, even if you don't have a clear view yet on the possible solutions. The real challenge here is not fishing for souls, but plunging into the water. At the Ministry of Education, Culture and Science, we are involved in the consequences of the digital shift for archives, libraries, museums, film, broadcasting, science and other areas. In all these fields, digitization, digital preservation and digital access are high on the agenda. And recently we have put more effort in connecting the activities in those areas. Now, stakeholders and the main national cultural heritage institutions work together on a roadmap for a joint infrastructure for digital heritage. And this will result in a shared perspective and strategy and coordinated programs on digital preservation and access, semantic standards and techniques, and public services and businesses. And I would like to emphasize the fact that working on this infrastructure isn't only about technical aspects like hardware, software, standards and architectures. It is about organization as well, governance, networks and capacities. The latter surely is an important issue in the sector, especially for smaller organizations. Because how do you enlarge your digital effort with only a handful of employees? I don't think this is an easy challenge. And making shifts is not always tempting because it means that you have to leave things you and maybe also your clients are so familiar with. But I think one of the solutions lies in good use of the features of the digital age, the digital networks and tools and their wide possibilities for new forms of cooperation. When we look back in history, every technical innovation has urged us to rethink and reset the way we deal with issues of intellectual property. From the, event, the invention of the printing of books, radio, film and television, to copiers and video. Each time the widening range of the new media and the decreasing costs of copying raised questions on how to manage intellectual property rights in both a rewarding and a productive way. This has always been a balancing act between the rewarding and empowerment of creatives and creating conditions to reach and provide audiences and users. This is no different in the digital revo revolution we are experiencing now. And though the complexity and speed of the evolving techniques and its social effects are unprecedented, it is still about figuring out this balance. First, this is the joint challenge for creatives, producers and users and the representative bodies. They should set the balance between fairness and productivity again and again. And I think the role of governments and other public authorities is to create good conditions for this circus and to give the results of this process a common validity. James Boyle pointed out the way copyright law developed in recent years. This has become a threat to the way we can preserve, distribute, revive and have access to our cultural heritage. And I agree with him that the cultural heritage institutions can be credited for putting this on the agenda. The need to get permission from each individual copyright holder impedes them in, genera in generating digital access to and digital preservation on the, of their collections, which are both main responsibilities of their public role. And the recent extension of copyright terms, therefore, is indeed a step in the wrong direction, as it reduces the possibilities for the needed made-to-measure solutions and deals. 
And as you might know, the Dutch government has pledged against this extension internationally, but without success. So you might argue that the established corporate interests have been starting to prevail and things are thrown off their balance. But apart from the imbalance, I think it's a real problem that deprives us of the needed flexibility. This way we create elephants and we need ants. So considering the role of the ministry from this perspective, you could say our focus in relation to copyrights and intellectual property is on three balanced goals. The first one is protecting creative performance. For example, by strengthening the position of creatives in relation to distributors and producers by improving our copyright contract law. Our second goal is encouraging the use of digital cultural content. And this, of course, includes cultural heritage. Our aim here is to find and embrace solutions that will take into account the legitimate interests of all stakeholders involved and that will really work in practice. Next to that, we will continue to make small steps in the adaptation of the legal conditions, for example, by the implementation of the, Dutch, of the European Orphan Work Directive in Dutch law. Our third goal is improving the use of friendliness of our, of our copyright law. This can contain both measures to make copyright law more flexible as international coordination and, and uniformization. This may, might sound as a contradiction, but I think that creating a more solid international common ground and making more room for spe spe specific movements on it is the way to go. For each of these goals, we are investigating what acts and which support we can deliver as a ministry in the coming years. Of course, we do this in close cooperation with the Ministry of Justice and the Ministry of Economic Affairs and within the possibilities and imperfection of international law, agreements and developments. What you see here is the takeoff of Felix Nada's balloon in front of the Palais for Volksflight in Amsterdam in 1874. I think it's a great image where you see a pioneering and inventive idea literally arise from the people. And when the genius of the net for culture lies in its decentralization of creation and curation to a billion people, as James Boyle stressed, cultural heritage institutions indeed have work to do. When you think of it, the challenges for cultural heritage institutions don't differ that much from the challenges for us civil servants. Essentially, it is about openness, trust and added value. And the digital shift urges cultural heritage institutions to make some shifts in the way they work. I will describe five of those shifts. The first one we detected is the shift from collection to connection. Though the physical and digital preservation of collections is very important, of course, we really need more focus on how to connect this content to users and other sources. That gives the actual added public value. Another shift is the one from medium to user. From a user perspective, the original medium used to distrib distribute and store information isn't always relevant at all. We should stop focusing on the supply-driven structure basis on types of media and collections and start thinking about what the demand of different types of users really is. A third shift, from control to concern. When adding public value in the public domain is our aim, heritage institutions could loosen their too anxious holds in their digital collections and instead put more effort in raising impact, guiding and improve user friendliness. And the Rijksmuseum has understood this already very well. A fourth shift from position to reputation. In the digital age, it seems no longer a sustainable strategy to lean on your formal position, neither as a person or as an institution. You have to gain your reputation, reputation and thus your possible impact on a daily basis by being there, being good, and being innovative on the net. And the last shift, from best to test. 
Professionals who work in the cultural heritage sector mostly are of the careful, precise, if not perfectionist type. And we need that, of course. But it is important to realize that being successful in the digital age asks for almost the opposite qualities. Release quick and release often is the motto of the internet startup scene. Knowing that keeping the things to yourself won't give you the ideas nor the resources to bring them to perfection. This clash of competences is a very interesting challenge for the cultural heritage sector. Finally, without losing the irony, Mr. Boyle, I think it's a thrilling idea to look at the Netherlands as one of the hotspots for the reformation movement of cultural access. On the one hand, we have to be careful to claim the reformative state of mind as a national asset, knowing that the well-praised open Dutch society in times hasn't been that tolerant and prog progressive at all. But we shouldn't feign modesty either. When you speak to international partners about the quality of the Netherlands with regards to digitization and cultural heritage, their amazement often is not primary on the infrastructure and body of digital content we already developed, but on our attentions to cross the borders between sectors, institutions and specialties and to cooperate successfully. The genius of the net connects very well with the habitus in the wetlands, you could say. Thank you very much for your attention. Oh, thank you very much. Um, we have about 15 minutes time for question and it's a bit difficult for me to see where people are who might be raising their hands. So if you have a question for either of the speakers, um, please raise your hand. Ah, easier to see. Oh, all the way at the back. Um, so I'm Sunimal Mendes and I'm from uh, the Max Planck Research School for Competition and Innovation Munich. Uh, and I'm interested in this topic since um, it is also my doctoral research uh, topic. I, would, I just have a question for um, uh, Mr. Boyle. Um, and that is, um, of course, it's, there, there is a definite interest in making sure that um, our cultural heritage, which is already in the public domain, remains in the public domain, uh, since it is the common property of all humankind. However, at present, especially in Europe, uh, there is a problem of um, finding the money which is necessary to put these uh, material into digital format. Um, and hence, um, since there is a, a lack of public funds and uh, funding from non-profit channels, um, there is a trend towards uh, going in for um, partnerships with for-profit institutions. But naturally, these institutions expect a return on their investment, and therefore, um, they require at least um, uh, uh, exclusivity or the right to control how these are used and accessed, at least for a short period of time. So we, are, uh, we have to today make the difficult choice between do we keep um, these materials in the public domain and therefore wait for the necessary funding to come from uh, public and non-profit sources, which could mean that their accessibility to the world um, is uh, put off uh, for a longer time, or do we make the contract with the devil and um, uh, allow private sector institutions to come in, um, digitize this material, perhaps um, have exclusivity over it for a short space of time, uh, get their money back, and then uh, revert it back to the public domain. I would just like to know what you think of this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, well, if you sup with the devil, the Scottish and I think also Dutch saying goes, you should use a long spoon. In this case, I think you should use a short term uh, of exclusivity. Um, it's an enormously difficult uh, problem, as you know, and, and doubtless as your dissertation will reveal, um, with powerful arguments on both sides. A um, couple of responses. Um, first, I do think that there, one needs to separate two things. Um, I think one, a genuine concern, and the other, I think, um, 
uh, an overblown concern. The genuine concern is exactly the one you um, identified, which is that we may effectively make the public domain private again in the very process of attempting to digitize it. And that's an enormous concern and a real problem. And what's more, from my experience, frequently these contracts are much better written on the side of the uh, private entities than they are on the public entities. They, um, they also, they're, obvious, they're often what we call agency costs. So for example, when the National Oceanic and Admi uh, Atmospheric Administration wants its um, photograph, its, its, its satellite photographs taken better, it have wants internal use, and it may reserve the right to get everything done internally when the private company does it, but it may forget that it also represents the public, and so it may not specify in there that anyone else does. And so, of course, the agency cost is you're not just representing your own agency, you need to represent everyone, and there's a real problem there. Again, this comes back to the Ombudsman for the public domain. Um, so that's, a, I think, a genuine danger. The exclusivity is a danger. I do think that there is a tendency more in Europe to assume that anything that is um, touched by um, f uh, money, by commercial um, uh, profit is ipso facto bad, and that I don't take that approach. Um, I actually think that you can attempt to design systems in which um, you actually put incentives to make the material fully open, but come up with other ways uh, of incentivizing the creator. For example, if your belief is that you can get thousands and thousands and thousands of page, uh, page views and your ministry is skeptical, you can have an incentive whereby the company gets paid more and more and more the more people look at it, for example. So you want the public and private incentives to be properly aligned, which at present they are not. Um, having said that, I think that one... Um, uh, approach that I would uh, make, which I would suggest, which I think is already being done here, both in the Rijksmuseum and in Europeana, is it's very hard to explain to people why they should value something they don't have and have not yet seen. That's the whole problem. The way that you get over that apparent problem, I think, is to have demonstration projects where people get really excited. So no, you can't make everything available, but maybe you can make those songs and photos from the Second World War available because you have enough money to do that internally. And the people go, this is amazing. Why isn't this done for everything? And that's the thing that you then take to your minister and go, well, gosh, you know, what a shame. But it seems there's a lot of uh, uh, desire. Um, Google Books has its detractors. I am concerned about the monopolistic component of it. One thing Google Books tells people is like, wow, you can find stuff in books that dead people wrote without going to libraries. And that's really cool. And that demonstration power is something that we should learn to use and that perhaps will minimize the need to make these exclusivity terms. Bottom line, I should answer the question and not hedge. Yes, those ways will get around it. If the only way to get the stuff out there is to do it, then I would make a deal. Uh, Sergey Brin said at the time of the Google Book Search project, which obviously has some of these dangers and that they have an exclusivity arrangement with the um, with the universities involved, in order for there, a there to be a thousand of such indexes, there first needs to be one. That's true. Uh, so that's not a deal I like, and I have real concerns about it, and I want antitrust enforcement on top of it. But if that's the only way I get access, I may end up taking that deal. Thank you. Great question. Other questions? I have a question for Mrs. Hamersma. Uh, there are still a lot of uh, museums and archives in the Netherlands who do not provide open access to the collections. Are you going to force them to do like the Rijksmuseum? <laughs> no, no, no. I don't think so. I don't think force is um, um, a way of um, treating them. But I think we would like to tempt them. And <laughs> like to help them, like to stimulate them. And um, I mentioned this joint group of people trying to get their infrastructure connected. Um, and we hope that in this roadmap we are writing together with them that we can take some aims, some goals of opening the archives and the libraries a bit more than they are now. But we have, I already said it, we have enormous amount of data information content digitized already. And I know we still have very interesting stuff in our archives, in our film archives, our television archives, our national archive. And I really hope that we can open, up, open it up a bit more. 
But it's not only a question of not willing it, we also need a little bit more money to open them up. And that's also a problem at the moment. But we will ask and tempt them to open them. I have a question uh, for Mrs. Hammersma and for Mr. Dibbets, for Mr. Boyle, uh, whoever. Um, <laughs> let's see. Um, I guess the Rijksmuseum gets millions of subventions, yes? F funded with millions of euros uh, to function. That's one. Uh, the other assumption is that uh, the making available in higher resolution of all the works in the Rijksmuseum um, is uh, limiting the possibilities to exploit the uh, pictures by earning millions with advertising companies uh, who want to make enormous blow-ups with works from the Rijksmuseum, uh, getting access to these works in high resolution quality. Has there been a deal between the Ministry and the Rijksmuseum in saying, ah, oh, well, what the hell with these millions? Let's do it this way, or uh, what is the policy yes, behind it? Yes, you can't reveal it. No. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I'm very no. uh, curious to know. No, I think Taku should answer that first, and then I can add something. But to answer, no, there is no deal. <laughs> um, I think in this time, the Rijksmuseum has, like other cultural institutions, a tight budget, but it is very much a choice of and priority it, it depends on the priority you give to it and yes it is an institution that does get millions of funding but it's also a huge institution um, and we have given it priority because we feel that through um, opening completely and through trying to get everything um, out there it is also in itself a huge advertisement and i always take the example um, of Louis Vuitton bags that are sold on every corner of the street. In the end, when people have the money, they immediately want the real thing. And it's the best advertisement Louis Vuitton has. So I wouldn't be afraid that the income you want to generate is not there anymore. We also found that the huge income that you um, ask if we have it, it wasn't that big. It was just enough to pay the people who were sorting out w who was using images illegally, yes or no. So it, and on the web, it's incredibly difficult to control your images. So we, rather, we would rather have people using a good image of the Rijksmuseum for free than picking a bad one, a bad with low res from the web and using that. The most famous case was Nestle using the milkmaid in the 1980s. We tried to block it, impossible. Because they just said, well, we had a photo from somewhere else and that's it. So I think and ma the main difficulty we have in giving the images for free, high res, it's not the artists, it's not the people who make the things. They love it to be in the Rijksmuseum website. It's, the pe it's their heirs. It's a, it's a foundation and the people, people afterwards who want to make the money of it. And I think that that's a problem we really have to tackle. And in that, I would agree with James. If you would, for example, limit the copyrights till the day somebody dies, that's all, that already would make a huge difference. So that's the answer to it. I'm not quite satisfied. <laughs> Go on. But just because I'm curious, not because I don't like the idea. Uh, my idea was if you uh, make, make it in a high resolution available, you want people to reproduce it, huh? because it's a reproduction quality. Uh, so you have a positive aim uh, when you make it available for everybody. And I thought, surely, it will be some kind of PR idea. And uh, it has its value, of course. I recognize that. It's uh, brought, uh, how do you say, penetration of the market. Everybody uh, will know uh, the works and will like to see the original. So it is worth something. You can uh, put a, a figure to it. I can understand that. The negative thing I can also understand, that chasing the infringers on the internet or wherever, terrible. But high resolution allows enormous blow-ups. Uh, it uh, allows, for instance, to make the girl with the pearl earring on the sail of a ship participating in the Volvo ocean race. Uh, so enormous advertising value. Uh, and the quality, the high resolution quality n necessary for those kind of advertising does not at all, uh, isn't at all important for 
uh, let's say, all day, every day, civilian uh, people who want to also use the images, put them on their websites, and so on and so on. So I would have thought you could have kept that source of income or could have developed that source of income when you sh if you didn't do so yet, because I didn't see the girl with the pearl earring on a Volvo ocean boat race uh, campaign. Uh, why didn't you develop that, that kind of income and nevertheless spread the, the images to everybody? I'm very curious. Well, first of all, it's not our main aim to earn money. I think that that's the no. We're we're a public no, but we're a public institution. <laughs> um, but the other the other side to it is that the if we would not um, make it available in high resolution, and I do think it serves the general public to make it available in high resolution because you can zoom into the images far. It makes for scientists for everybody. It's a great thing to have. Um, if we would charge a lot for it, then they would either get their image from somewhere else in a lower resolution, saying, well, that will do, or they will just go to another museum that does give it. So I think that it's, it's a model like we saw in the music industry, and that taught me a lot, but it's a model of trying to make money that's archaic. And I think we have to, you do as an art, you can as an artist make money, but you will have to do it in other ways because this is not the way it will work anymore, because the net in itself um, opposes to this, to this financial model, so it will, it, it's valuable. So that's, that's the answer. <laughs> and yes, we make lots of appointments, but not here, <laughs> in public. Okay, um, I thought there was one question over here, and then we can take one more afterwards. I have a question for Mr. Boyle. Uh, my name is Lisette Kalshoff, I work at Kennisland, and as such I speak to a lot of cultural heritage institutions trying to convince them to open up as much as they can. Um, and I've recently heard a new argument against, so I was hoping whether you could help me uh, to convince them otherwise. Um, the argument the institution in question um, gave me was not the fact that the audio files that they had were not copyright protected anymore. They agreed that it was indeed in the public domain. Uh, however, they will uh, not put them on their website as such because of moral and ethical rights within the audio files. So the material was so sensitive uh, that they don't want to share them online. Hmm. However, they already put them on their website under a non-commercial uh, bespoke license. Was this in the United States? It or was in, in the United Kingdom. In the United Kingdom. So I was hoping you could help me out with that one. Well, I think there are lots of legitimate concerns involved in issues like this. For example, um, documentarians conduct interviews with their subjects. Um, those interviews are fascinating for historians going through. The documentarian may make an agreement with the subject that says, look, I will present you know, the other argument only with your argument, I will give you that. I'm, you, you, know, you don't get a veto on the final say, but I give you my word. This is how your material would be presented in this context. Later, somebody else comes along and gets that, and they say, great, I just want to put up this interview you know, by itself, stripped of its context, thus implicitly violating that. That's not obviously a copyright issue at all. It has no copyright relevance whatsoever. Um, the copyright status is one thing, this is something else. Um, I think um, any heritage institution has to be attentive to things like that. Um, on the other hand, with Creative Commons, and Paul has this experience, we found a lot of sort of people saying, this will be terrible, it will be a disaster. And I myself was one of the doomsayers. I'm from Scotland, it's my job to be a doomsayer. And many of the dooms did not come about. So I think one of the things one has to do is push back really hard on what kinds of harm could actually be done. And I did want to just, uh, I, I hope that's a, that's a decent answer. I, I think you have to look at what are these moral and ethical concerns. Um, and the fact that they're putting them up under a non-commercial license puzzles me because if, what does the, whether it's non-commercial or not matter to the moral or ethical point. Um, just one, I think, to the last interesting, very interesting colloquy um, on the for-profit, not-for-profit, you know, making available kinds of dilemmas. I'm going to offer an analogy, and I'm not going to claim that it's perfectly applicable, because I don't think it is, but I think it's, it's interesting. Um, Europe and the US provide a natural experiment in terms of the way that they deal with weather data. 
Um, by and large, not universally true, and it's changing in the EU, but nevertheless, by and large, the EU is much more restrictive and charges much more for state weather data. Basically, encouraging those who are using it to pay for it. Standard approach in the marketplace, right? Why not? Makes sense. Normally, you know, people who buy gasoline pay for the gasoline, right? It seems like a reasonable way of pricing. And so you try and say, well, what's the value to you? And the idea is this will cover the cost of raising the, the weather data and the circle will be closed. And they actually do pretty well out of it. Um, the studies of the return on investment there show that the EU gets about an eightfold return, which is not directly in money frequently, but it is in more efficient economic decisions. So I plan my holiday, but I don't plan it when it's raining, or I, I build my skyscraper, but I realize there's going to be mud going into it, so I don't do it then, and so we improve my efficiency. The US, by contrast, ironically, takes the socialist approach and puts everything up for free, and it's available at the cost of reproduction. Um, you can get the entire set of US weather data for the cost of a box of DVDs. It, everything is free. And so you might think, well, that, is that going to work? Well, they get about a 32-fold return on investment. And the reason is that people get that stuff, and they then layer their own private stuff on top of it and sell it or make better decisions. The person who wouldn't pay because they didn't know how valuable it would be to their business and thus couldn't price is willing to buy at price zero, right? Because it's zero. Uh, this is actually Kenneth Arrow, the great economist, called this the, the efficiency uh, pricing dilemma, that you can't value a good that you don't have. But once you have it, then you can't be dispossessed of it. With information, this is a problem. If you make it available for zero, you get all these, you get the weather channel, it adds its own secret sauce, its own proprietary stuff, it puts it out there. You get all these other specialist people who do little algorithms for corn farmers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Huge weather industry in the US. Jobs, economic growth, tax receipts, Right? It's not direct money being paid back to the government, but the effect on the economy is enormous. And the reason that it's available is that all the people who didn't know they wanted it and probably wouldn't have paid for it get it and can do stuff with it. Does that apply to cultural heritage material made available free? Well, not obviously point for point. I mean, weather data is just so much more obviously instrumentally useful. But my belief is that in many cases, this kind of model can actually give us returns, both spiritual and economic, that we would be surprised at. And that's why my big call is for experimentation, because that way we'll find out and the facts will chasten us. Question over here. Hi, it's for, for Mr. Boyle. I'm Nienke van der Waal from Museum Boymans van Beuningen in Rotterdam. And I was wondering if you believe that uh, artists and copyright owners also have responsibility in uh, um, giving accessibility to the objects they produce or where they hold the copyright of. That's a great question. Um, I think that um, the answer to that is sector specific. So um, I very much want for artists to be supported and paid. I think there are many mechanisms for us to do that, but I want them to get paid. And I think the uh, answer for people doing creative work is very different. In my own view, basic scholarly research, the role of a researcher in a university is to make that as widely available as possible. Um, I put all my books out under Creative Commons licenses so you can download them for free. And I view that as a moral responsibility of me as an author. Ironically, it actually is also very good business sense, but that's not the reason I do it. Um, I have worked, as Paul has, with um, Creative Commons to make sure that we have moved to a system, and Creative Commons was a very small part of this, but it was a part of it, to a system in which government-funded research is shifting to a model that I think is going to be available on the open web for everyone to use and build upon, and we'll get the returns that we couldn't have seen foreseen because people didn't have access to the material. So for that, I would say, yes, for that sector, I would say the norm should be universal access. The moral for access to, moral warrant for access to knowledge, like access to culture, is I have a pulse, right? That's, that's my baseline. There may be exceptions, but they're exceptions, not the norm. As a, a visual artist or a filmmaker or a musician, no, I don't think that they have that kind of same um, moral obligation. I think many of them have found that being more open and experimenting with it has actually yielded great benefits to them, but I think that's their decision to make. 
And one of the things about Creative Commons is that it's letting you exercise your copyright the way you want to, not imposing our vision of how to do it. So I think it has to be a specific, a sector specific answer. Um, I think a lot of artists do feel that morally. And I commend those who do and make their, their works available and share them. My friend Cory Doctorow puts out all of his novels like that. Uh, Davis Guggenheim, who made An Inconvenient Truth, you know, makes his documentaries frequently available like that. And I, I think they do that because they believe in their message. But that's not for me to preach to all artists, all creators, and say, I have, you know, I know what your responsibilities are. I, I wouldn't be arrogant to, en enough to do that. But it's a great question. OK, thank you. Um, thanks again to all our speakers. Thanks.